Hello, my name is Father Gregory Pine, and I'm a Dominican friar of the province of St. Joseph, and this is Pines with Aquinas. So recently somebody asked me a question, specifically whether God is in hell, or maybe the way in which God can be said to be in hell, which is a paradoxical question, but they were coming at it from this vantage. They were thinking about the sinner who persists or perseveres in his sin, and who might be said as a result to kind of decreate himself to such a point where he distances himself from God so as to, I don't know, absent himself from the divine presence. And I was like, interesting, but not how I would go about explaining it. So then in answer to the question, Father Gregory, how would you go about explaining it? I respond, here we go. Okay, so part of what motivates this question is the concern like, how total is the abandon that the fallen angel or that the damned soul experiences in hell? Uh, and we might be concerned about that for a variety of reasons, but, you know, it's a thing to think about. Uh, and, and one of the ways that we can approach the question is to think about how, how God might be said to be anywhere, and then whether any of those characterizations might, uh, might have a place in hell itself. So... To be in a place can be said in two basic ways. This is not an exhaustive treatment, but you know it kind of covers most of what we're going to describe. So we typically think about places like where something is contained or where something is located. So I am sitting in this chair, in this cell, in this convent, in this country, on this planet, etc. Uh, so this kind of harkens back to Aristotle's definition of place and he talks about it as like the innermost boundary of the containing body. Uh, so that, that'd just be the typical sense of place. The other sense of place would be where power is exercised. Okay, so you can said to be in a place as contained therein, or you can be said to be in a place as acting thereupon. Now this one is a little more abstract, I suppose. Um, but I can be said to be in a place insofar as, let's say that, I live with a brother and I threaten him like, if you don't do the dishes, then I will give you a wet willy. Um, and he's in the kitchen right now thinking about not doing the dishes, but the thought of getting a wet willy and the shame that would be attached to that. One, receiving a wet willy. Two, receiving it from an American. Uh, just kidding, but seriously. Uh, yeah, he, it just, it's insupportable, so he does the dishes. I can be said to be in the kitchen, in a certain sense, because I am exercising my menacing power there. Uh -huh. Okay, so when talking about place, with the first one, as contained therein, God is pure spirit. So he doesn't have, you know, this sense of place going on in the ordinary course. Although, we're going to introduce some wrinkles into that. And then in the second sense, you know, God, as acting thereupon, well, this applies to all created things. So God is acting on all created things insofar as were he not acting on them, <laughs> they would cease to exist. Okay, so then let's think a little bit now with this sweet distinction in tow about where is God. And I think that, you know, as Christians, when we think about this question, it's natural to start with Christ because we believe that our Lord Jesus Christ took human flesh uh, that he was born of the virgin, born under the law, to deliver from the law those who were subject to it, that he lived a genuine bodily life, you know, that he suffered, died, was buried, rose again from the dead, ascended, sits at the right hand of the Father, and exercises judgment from that place. So, uh, so, so Christ has a body. Our Lady has a body as well, which makes answering the question of where Christ is at present a kind of relative question. So where is Christ? He's next to the Blessed Virgin Mary. Where is the Blessed Mer Virgin Mary? She is next to Christ. Where is that? I do not know. Heaven. Um, so Christ has a body. Uh, he had a body during his earthly life. He has a body in his heavenly life. So that's one sense in which we can answer the question, where is God? God is in his Christ because he is God. Uh, but also, you know, he's present in the Eucharist. And I think that the language of presence makes us think of the Eucharist pretty naturally because we talk about the Eucharist as the real presence. When we say that, we're saying something pretty specific. So God is present in all seven sacraments. He's present there, you ready for this? Oh yeah, by mode of sacrament. You didn't see that coming, I know. Uh, so he's present by mode of sacrament, which means he's made present by the sign. 
by these signs, these sacred signs, which make men holy. So they're very thick signs. They're particular kinds of signs. But in the Eucharist, not only is he present by mode of sacrament, he is also present by mode of, wait for it, substance. Boom. Uh, so when our Lord institutes the sacrament, when he fills the signification with its purpose and with its end, not only does he say like, all right, you're going to be washed from sin, or all right, you're going to be cleansed from Pope debt, Pope, blah, 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 Pope, oh my gosh, I'm struggling over here, post baptismal sin, or he doesn't, okay, dot, dot, dot. I'm not going to give more examples because I'll just confuse more words. But when he institutes the sacrament of the Eucharist, the sign points to his bodily presence, right? It, it points to his substantial presence. So he says, this is my body. And so in a certain sense, the sacrifice of the Mass is already perfected. When you confect the Eucharist, the reception of those sacred elements brings it to its term, its ultimate term, which is the union of the mystical body, but now I'm, I'm getting farther afield. Okay, so Christ is present in heaven. He's present in the Eucharist. God is present in heaven. God is present in the Eucharist. But then we also talk about how God is present in the souls of the just here on earth and then in heaven. Uh, so here on earth, it's, it's somewhat fragile, but in heaven, it's uh, complete. Uh, it can't be lost. It can't be diminished. You have no fear that either would arise. Uh, so it's a kind of thickening or strengthening of that grace, which we call glory. And, and there we say that God dwells as in a temple. So the Son is sent into this world in human flesh. The Holy Spirit descends upon him. We see that at the baptism. We see that at the transfiguration. We see that in the upper room. We see that in the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2 at Pentecost. Right? So the Holy Spirit is also made visible in certain ways in the New Testament. But their visible missions also signify or they signal invisible missions. So, so Christ is sent to our interior life and he sends the Spirit with the Father in the, you know, like the depths of our heart. So we talk about ourselves as temples of the Holy Ghost or temples of the Most Blessed Trinity, that God dwells in us as such, as in a temple. Um, so that's another way in which God is present. He's present in the souls of the just, both here on earth and in heaven, by the gift of grace, which is our created participation in his divine life. So it's a kind of intensification of his presence, or it's a way in which we kind of turn towards his presence more deliberately or intentionally and receive the, the created effects of that relationship as they flood our souls. So I've been kind of like, I suppose, going down the hierarchy from the most potent to the most, what would one say? Eh, I don't know if I want to extend that description any further. We just went from Christ to the Eucharist to grace. All right, they're all potent. Uh, but then we arrive at the most basic way in which God is present. When St. Thomas describes this, he says, He's present to all of creation by, ready, essence, presence, and power. You're like, holy smokes, you use the word in the definition. That is like a big no-no. Well, okay, good point. Basically, when he talks about essence, presence, and power, he says that God is present to us as creating us, like as continually creating us, as conserving us in being. He is also present as giving us agency, okay, uh, and then conserving that agency in being. And then he's also present to us insofar as like all things are transparent to his gaze. That's basically what we mean by essence, presence, and power. So he gives us being, he gives us our particular mode of agency, he sustains both or conserves both throughout the course of our lives, and then all things, us included, are transparent to his gaze. And this is just a fact that flows from our created state. So here we've arrived then at a resource which will help us to answer the question of whether God is present in hell. And so we can say, not in the first three senses. So Christ is in heaven, locally speaking, Christ is in heaven. And then the sacraments aren't celebrated in hell, they're only celebrated on earth. Spoiler alert, not celebrated in heaven. Wild, maybe another video on that. Okay, so he's not present in the sacramental and substantial sense. Right? Nor is he present in grace, because the souls of the damned and the fallen angels have banished the life of grace from their hearts, culpably so. So they have chosen against it, and then they have been ratified in that choice against. But God remains present to the fallen angels and to the damned uh, by essence, presence, and power. Insofar as he continues to sustain them in being, he continues to conserve their agency, and they remain transparent to his gaze. So in that most basic or foundational sense, yes, God may be said to be present. God may be, in fact, present. God is present. Speak clearly, Father Gregory. 
Uh, God is present as exercising his agency thereupon or as acting thereupon. So in that second sense of place that we describe at the top of the episode. So boom, that is what I wanted to say. Cheers to you, my friends. You just learned a little bit, I hope. Uh, if not, my bad. Um, some final thoughts. Well, this is Pines with the Aquinas. If you haven't yet, please do subscribe to the channel, push the bell, and get email updates when other cool things happen here, virtually speaking. Uh, also, I contribute to a podcast called Godsplaining with four other Dominican friars. All kinds of sweet things going on there. Um, and we are announcing our retreats for this upcoming summer and fall with our next episode. Uh, so that'll be sweet. I hope you tune in for that episode, and I hope you sign up to those retreats because we'd love to see you there. Uh, it was a great grace this past summer to have three retreats, which were boss. A lot of people came, and uh, yeah, we had a wonderful time, a holy time, and a fun time. Uh, so yes, God's planning, boom. And then the last thing is I wrote a book. It's called Prudence, Choose Confidently, Live Boldly, and yeah, I think it's helpful. So I hope you find it helpful too. That's all for me. Know of my prayers for you. Please pray for me, and I will look forward to chatting with you next time on Pines with Aquinas.